Good evening. That film of the Battle of Amman is the first to come out of the Jordanian capital since the fighting began seven days ago. It was flown out today by one of our two reporters in the city, Keith Hatfield, and we'll be showing you much more of it in just a moment. But first, the headlines on today's fighting. King Hussein has claimed that his forces in the north have given the Syrians a bloody nose, and the towns of Erbid and Ramta are said to be in royalist hands. His commander-in-chief, Field Marshal Majali, says that the Syrians have retreated in disorder back into Syria, and his forces now hold the vital crossroads south of Ramta, the key to the guerrilla supply route to Amman. Majali's claim is supported by Israeli observers and by Sandy Gaul, who's in Syria. He saw the Syrian-based tanks pulling back. But earlier, the guerrillas claimed a major victory at Ajloun, and they said it was one of the fiercest in the campaign. Well, that's the situation in the north. But in Amman itself, the position seems to be this. Guerrilla snipers are still holding out in the old centre of the town, with the army using artillery and tanks to blast them out. But the main fighting in the past 24 hours has been in the two refugee camps, Jebel Hussein and Jebel Khwadat. The army have been pouring mortar fire into the camps, which are heavily defended by the guerrillas. And the guerrillas say the Jordanians are destroying every inch of the Hussein refugee camp. So that's the overall battle situation tonight, the sixth night of the fight for Amman, a battle which has left the city in a state of ruin, death and starvation. A battle which has swirled around the Intercontinental Hotel, perched on one of the seven hills of Amman. And trapped inside were a hundred journalists. If they looked out of the windows, they were shot at by both sides. Even so, ITN's two film crews managed to film this report by Michael Nicholson and Keith Hatfield. The firing started at exactly 10 to 5 this morning, just as Imam was waking up to the first day of its proposed general strike. Earlier on, the guerrillas moved in their heavy armoury, their B-40s and B-20 rockets, and their heavy machine guns. And a few moments ago, from the hills close to the Royal Palace, the Royal Jordanian Army began firing its artillery into the centre of Amman. Firing now has been continuing for... The firing's been continuing now for close on an hour and a half. The rocket launches of the B-40 rockets are right into the centre of Amman, firing towards the Jordanian artillery. There is no one on the streets. Cars stopped and drivers have left them where they'd stopped. You can hear the whistles of the B-20s pass over the hotel. There goes another. And from the centre of Amman, right under the sun, the smoke is beginning to rise from the explosions. Tanks and Saladin armoured cars were ordered into Oman shortly after six this morning, an hour after the fighting first broke out. As they drove through the town, they were met with rocket and machine gun fire from the guerrillas. Despite the gunfire, the only visible sign of the guerrillas was as they moved from house to house, carrying their wounded with them. Only dogs roam the streets at will searching out scraps of food. The 
guerrillas operated mainly in small groups, carrying their rockets and ammunition with them, trying to escape the massive army firepower. <laughs> Both Al Fatah Radio, representing the biggest guerrilla group, and the military government broadcast at regular intervals. The government announced a 24 hour curfew, warning that anyone seen on the streets would be shot on sight. Also warned that if firing was seen coming from any house, the tanks would demolish it and the houses on both sides. The threat was carried out. All today, smoke has been rising over Oman as the tanks fired at point blank range. The guerrillas' main fuel supply was hit, and so were two of their camps nearby. Whether this is the final showdown or not, King Hussein has never before ordered such drastic action. Much of the fighting was centered near the embassies and around the Intercontinental Hotel where we stayed. The hotel, the American Embassy and the British Embassy were shelled by guerrilla mortars. A Swedish cameraman filming from a balcony was wounded in the leg by sniper fire. He lay in the corridor for at least three hours, and then he was taken unconscious away by an ambulance of the Jordanian army to hospital for immediate treatment. Downstairs in the basement, hotel guests, including a mother and her child, sheltered from the mortar and machine gun fire. The rest of us, including the journalists and cameramen, had no choice but to stay close to the floor in the main foyer, getting news out as best they could. Declaring Poland. We are waiting for orders on At 2.45 in the afternoon, the guerrillas began a new attack on the Jordanian troops surrounding us. That was mortar. That was a mortar right in the front garden. We literally... We literally cannot move in this ground. We are caught in between crossfire, the Federine on the back of the hotel and to the left. And the artillery are firing directly into our ground. The loud bang you heard then was mortar fire. OK, let's clear out. The second day of the fighting, and although King Hussein and his army said that last night they thought they were in control of the main parts of Amman, 
it's quite clear that during the night the guerrillas moved in reinforcements and the army lost ground. The guerrillas have been firing recallless rockets and rifles at the army. We were woken at five o'clock this morning to intense gunfire, gunfire from tanks, from rockets, from mortars and from artillery. We have been told that we must not show ourselves at the windows or in the lobby of this hotel because if we do, the army will shoot us on sight. During the morning of the second day, the firing drew nearer to us and became more intense. Damage to our hotel was considerable. It was hit by two rockets and the army set up mortars and machine guns in and around the hotel grounds. The blast from army recoilless rifles blew out all the windows. At one o'clock, the army halted their advance to give the guerrillas a chance to surrender. But the firing continued. The 140 guests in the hotel, most of them pressmen, rely on the radio to keep them in touch with events outside Amman and to learn of any political moves. A government broadcast describes the guerrilla's effort as the most serious and devastating plot ever known in the Arab world. Water supplies, electricity and communications have all been cut. The hotel's water tanks ran dry today. As in most homes in Amman, we're now relying on water we've stored in bottles and in cans. Food is also running short. We have enough left for one day. Lunch was a cup of tea and half a cream cake. But probably we're fortunate. While we've been able to draw on the hotel's stores, most of the people in Amman, particularly the thousands of Palestinian refugees in their camps, will almost certainly be out of food by now. Tonight we can still hear the sound of firing in Amman, but we've all been moved down into the basement of the hotel here. An army major has just been in to tell us that he will do all he can to protect us, but that he thinks the fighting will go on for at least another three days. Tomorrow the army will be moving into the center of Amman to try and flush out the guerrillas who are hiding in the alleyways and the houses there. The time is now nine o'clock on Friday the 18th. Keith Hatfield, News at 10, Amman. The Battle of Amman, the battle that's still going on. Our reporters, Michael Nicholson and Keith Hatfield, the cameramen, Paul Carlton and Felix Yaxis, the sound recordists, Brian Irwin and Andreas Mavris. Nicholson and Carlton have stayed on to see the outcome of the Civil War. What was the situation like in Amman when Keith Hatfield flew out this morning? Keith, first of all, how did you manage to get out of Amman with your film? Well, I was, I was brought out because the Red Cross uh, suggested that I should leave as a medivac case because they diagnosed that I was suffering with uh, dysentery about three days ago. And so yesterday I went with the Red Cross to the airport in a, a, a military escorted convoy along with about 30 other journalists who were going to try and get out of Amman on board the uh, Red Cross airplane. We set off from the Intercontinental Hotel where we've been for the past six days and uh, about half a mile from the airport, we came under sniper fire, and then the, the commander, the, the major in charge of the convoy, went ahead of us to the airport to receive fresh instructions. He came back and said that the road was now clear. They cleared up the sniper on the road, but by the time we got to the airport, the, uh, the, the plane had left for Beirut, and so we had to spend the night at the airport. Did you hear a lot of firing while you were at the airport? Yes, very much so, although the airport is about eight miles from the town, but it's very near um, a, a Palestinian refugee camp, and all night you could see the bombardment on this camp, and this morning the smoke and the dust was still above this camp. But in, in Amman itself, you could still hear uh, artillery fire, but it was very distant. Could you describe what the scenes were like in the streets of Amman as you, as you drove out towards the airport? Well, it's incredible the, the firepower that the Jordanian army must have had in Amman, because as you drove along the streets, there were piles upon piles of cartridge cases and uh, empty spent shell cases from recoilless rockets. I didn't see a single house that was not touched by uh, shells or bullets until you got very near the airport, where the, the uh, houses bore white flags and loyal flags. But in Amman itself, nearly every house was either burnt out or peppered with shells and bullets. And presumably casualties in the streets. Yes, no, no, no evidence. I didn't see any evidence of casualties. The Red Cross have been around the streets of Amman during the times that the curfew was lift lifted, 
But uh, when we went up there this morning, there was certainly no sign of casualties. But there must be thousands upon thousands of casualties. Looking from the hotel into the town, into the built-up areas of the town, into the areas where the, the camps are, uh, any area that sustains the barrage of artillery and mortar and rocket attacks that these areas have, then the, there must be thousands of people hurt. The, the estimate in Amman today was 20,000 dead and injured in Jordan. I wouldn't be prepared to, to disagree with that. Now, during the fighting, you were holed up in the Intercontinental Hotel. What was life like for you and the other correspondents there? Well, it gave me dysentery, for one thing. It was pretty grim. Uh, we, we had enough food in the hotel stores to give us meals of uh, water and rice each day. We had a cup of tea in the morning, which was an absolute luxury. Um, we were told by the army after the second day that any person showing themselves out of the, outside the hotel, either in, in their rooms or on the balconies, would be shot on sight. Uh, a Russian cameraman has been shot dead, a Swedish cameraman has been shot through the leg, and uh, that was the situation. We, we, we were kept, therefore, pinned down in our corridors and in the basement of the hotel. Uh, I did try one day to sleep in my room. I slept on the mattress on the floor with the base of the bed against the window. Um, but a mortar exploded on the balcony outside, and the shrapnel came into the room. I woke to the, I think, the, to the uh, noise of the mortar explosion, but woke to find a very hot piece of metal near my back of my trousers. Uh, I tried to lift it up and throw it away, but it was much too hot. And there, was, there was shrapnel all around the room in the walls and in the bathroom. I also had two bullets through the window, and I think everybody shared this sort of experience. You had no chance during this fighting of getting out of the hotel itself? Only at the period, uh, periods when the curfew was lifted. We did, when this was lifted, make our way to the British Embassy, which was about a five-minute walk away, to try and get ourselves evacuated and to try and get relief in, to try and get the film and the story out. Uh, during this period, I went for a walk down the road to see what the damage was and came under sniper fire again. Uh, this time, I disappeared over a wall. The army obviously located the sniper, um, fired off every weapon they had available, which included Sal Saladin cars, um, heavy machine guns and mortars, and the building where the sniper was just disappeared, and there was no building left. Th this was the army carrying out their threat. They would demolish any building used by snipers. We hear stories that, uh, or reports rather, that the army are carrying out executions in the streets. Did you see any evidence of that at all? None at all, no. What about the airline hostages? Is there a search going on for them in Amman? Yes, indeed. The King, King Hussein has appointed a select group of soldiers, known as the Red Berets, to spearhead attacks on uh, refugee camps where he believes the, uh, the hijacked victims might be held. Uh, they have done so. A lot of the uh, camps have been destroyed. A lot of them have been hit very badly. So far, there's no sign of the hostages, and I cannot report further than that on that. And, of course, there's an enormous task now facing the Red Cross relief workers. Yes, indeed. The, the Red Cross this morning flew in, <coughs> excuse me, in the, the plane we came out on this morning, flew in uh, six and a half tons of medical supplies, which we helped to unload before we came back. But they're coming in at the rate of only one or two a day. And the, the hospitals in Amman simply can't cope with the casualties that there are. King Hussein has already agreed that the casualties are disproportionate the number of Fedayeen, the number of guerrillas they're fighting, and they can't cope without outside relief. Keith Hatfield, just in from Amman. Well, now for a break, and then we'll move north to the Syrian border where Jordan says she's got the Syrians on the run. Despite tonight's claim by the Jordanian army chief Field Marshal Majale that his tanks have routed the guerrillas in the north and sent the Syrian invaders back across the border, there's still heavy fighting going on around Irbid and Ramtha. Eyewitnesses said that as the Syrian tanks began to draw back, Jordanian hunter jets bombed them with TNT and blasted them with napalm. The Jordanians claim to have knocked out 150 Syrian tanks. That's half the force that invaded Jordan. They say all the rest have retreated across the border. The Jordanians are fighting for the two vital towns near the Syrian border, Irbid and Ramtha, and the supply route from Syria to Amman that runs between them. During the past few days, the Jordanian army's 40th Armoured Brigade of 150 tanks in all has been gradually massing ready for today's big attack. 
Every tank that could be spared from the Amman area was sent out. This was to be and has been the biggest offensive of the six days the civil war has been going on. The guerrillas had seized the northern sector at the start of the war. The Jordanians made several attempts to get through and lost 30 tanks in short but vicious battles. But at 11 o'clock this morning, they began their first massive assault. And the latest reports say they've driven the guerrillas back just six miles. The Syrians say the fight in the North Jordan is still going on. They deny that the Jordanians have beaten the Palestinian Liberation Army back across the border. But Sandy Gall, who's in Syria and has been down to the border, saw some of the casualties coming back. And he's just sent us this report. Reports in Damascus tonight say that Jordanian armored units are fighting the Syrian Ba'ath guerrillas only 40 kilometers from the border, south of the little town of Ramadan. Tanks and ambulances were seen moving through Daraa on the Syrian side of the border this afternoon. And I personally counted about 10 tanks being taken south on tank transporters. Presumably the casualties from the battle on the other side of the border. Damascus itself is remarkably calm. You'd never think that there was a battle going on only about 80 miles away. The Syrians say that the tanks fighting the Jordanian forces across the border are not part of their army. They say that they belong to the guerrillas and are purely the concern of the guerrillas. This is Sandy Gall, News at 10, Damascus. And our reporter Richard Lindley, who's in Tel Aviv, has just telephoned to say that Israeli military observers are convinced the guerrillas have been driven right back. Israeli forces on the border with Jordan remain on the alert tonight. Lindley said that it may well be the reports of Israeli readiness to intervene hasten the Syrian retreat. King Hussein appeared briefly before cameras yesterday, the first we've seen of him since the fighting started six days ago. He said his forces had given Syrian forces invading North Jordan a bloody nose. He said that his officers believed that in Amman they were fighting not only guerrillas, but the regular soldiers of Arab countries who'd infiltrated the capital from neighboring states. In reference to the tank attack from Syria, he said, we had not expected an attack from an Arab country. We were hit from the back, but we have stopped this and were hitting back. With the situation in Jordan apparently going his way today, King Hussein was back at the radio set in his summer palace, getting in touch again with his radio ham friends all over the world. And here's how he spoke to Laurie Margulis of Ilford, telling him that the situation was much better and that everything tonight was quiet. The guerrilla commander-in-chief Yasser Arafat has rejected a peace agreement and ceasefire announced earlier today by King Hussein and acknowledged by the Arab leader's peace mission which went to Amman from Cairo. The first evacuation of British citizens from Jordan has got underway. 30 women and children flew into Cyprus a short time ago and are expected in London tomorrow. America is expected to decide within the next 24 hours whether to evacuate some or all of its 400 citizens inside Jordan. In Moscow, the Soviet President Nikolai Podgorny has called for an end as soon as possible to the war in Jordan. And he's warned that the Soviet Union considers any outside interference as inadmissible. He charged that the movements of the American Sixth Fleet showed there was a grave risk of intervention in Jordan by external forces. It's been a dramatic day in the Jordanian Civil War, a day in which King Hussein appears to have turned the tables on the guerrillas. And that's it for tonight from News at 10 from us. Good night to you.